The Selection, Chapter 20. The Queen's family stayed a few days, and the visitors from Sweet a day, a certain, a certain week, the entire week. They did a segment on the report discussing international relations and movements toward more peace for both nations. It was now a month into our stay at the palace, and I was completely at home. My body was comfortable in the new climate. The warmth of the palace was heavenly, like a holiday. September was almost over, and it got very cool in the evenings, but it was much warmer than home. The sights of this giant space were, were no longer a mystery. The sounds of heeled shoes on marble, crystal glass, glasses clinking, guards marching. They were starting to become as normal as the refrigerator humming or grad kicking a ball, a soccer ball up against the house. Meals with the royal family and times in the women's room were staples in my routine. But the middle moments of my days were always new. I spent a lot of time working on music. The instruments at the palace were far superior than the ones I had at home. I had to admit they were making me spoiled. The quality of the sound was unimaginably better and the women's room had gotten a little more exciting as the queen had showed up at least twice now. She hadn't really spoken to anyone yet, but she sat in a comfortable chair with her maids at her side, watching as we read and conversed. In general, the omaticity had settled as well. We were getting used to one another, and we finally found out the magazine's top pics of our photographs. I was shocked to see I was one of the front runners. Marlene was in the top space with Chris and Tolulu and Brielle close behind. Celeste didn't talk to Brielle for days upon hearing this, but eventually let everyone let it pass. What still seemed to bring the most tension were the bits of information tossed around. Whoever had been with Maxton recently couldn't help but gush about their little interlude. The way everyone spoke, it seemed as if Maxton was going to be choosing six or seven wives, but not everyone was shining in their experience. For instance, Marlene had more than a few dates with Maxton, which put everyone on edge. Still, she never came across as excited as she had after their very first one. America, if I tell you this, you have to swear not to tell a soul, she said as we walked in the garden. I knew it was something serious. She wanted, she waited until we got away from the listening ears in the women's room and far beyond the eyes of the guards. Of course, Marlene, are you all right? Yes, I'm fine. I just, I need your opinion on something. Her face was heavy with worry. What's wrong? She bit her lip. It's Maxton. I'm not sure it's going to work out. She looked down. What makes you think that? I asked, concern. Well, for starters, I don't, I don't feel anything, you know? No spark, no connection. Maxton can be a little shy is all. You have to give him time. This was true. I was surprised she didn't know that about him. No, I mean, I don't like him. Oh, this was something very different. Have you tried? What a stupid question. Yes, so hard. I keep waiting for the moment to come when he'll say or do something. It'll make me feel like I have something in common, but it never happens. I think he's handsome, and that's not enough to build a whole relationship on. I don't even know if he's attracted to me. Do you have any idea what kind of things he, you know, likes? I thought about it. No, actually. We've only talked about what he's looking for in the physical department. And that's the other thing. We never talk. He talks on and on to you, and we never seem to have anything to say. We spend a lot of our time quietly watching something or playing cards. She looked more worried by the minute. Sometimes we're quiet together, too. Sometimes we just sit and say nothing. Besides, feeling like that don't always happen overnight. Maybe you're both just taking it slow. I tried to sound reassuring. Marlene looked like she was on the verge of tears. Honestly, America, I think the only reason I'm still here is because people like me so much. I think their opinions matter to him. That thought hadn't occurred to me, and it sounded plausible. Long ago, I dismissed their opinion, but Maxton loved his people. They had more on of a hand in choosing the next princess than they would know. And besides, she whispered, everything between us feels so empty. Then the tears came. I sighed and hugged her. Truthfully, I wanted to say to be here for here with me. But if she didn't love Maxton, Marlene, if you don't want to be with Maxton, I don't, I think you need to tell him. Oh no, I don't think I can. You have to. He doesn't want to marry someone who doesn't love him. And if you don't have any feelings for me, he needs to know. She shook her head. I can't just ask to leave. I need to stay. I can't go home. Not now. Why Marlene? What's keeping you here? For a moment, I wondered if Marlene and I shared the same dark secret. Maybe there was someone she needed distance from too. 
The only difference in our situations was that Maxon knew about mine, and I wanted her to say it. I wanted to know I wasn't the only one who ended up here out of ridiculous circumstances. But Marlene's tears stopped almost as quickly as they started. She sniffed a few times and straightened up. She smoothed out her dress, squared her shoulders, and turned her head to me. She pulled a strong, warm smile on her face and spoke. You know what? I bet you're right. She started to back away. I'm sure I just will give it some time. It'll all work out. I have to go. Tiny's expecting me. Marlene half ran back to the palace. What in the world had come over her? The next day, Marlene avoided me. And the day after that, too. I made a point of sitting in the women's room at a safe distance, making sure to acknowledge her whenever we crossed paths. I wanted her to know that she could trust me, but I wouldn't make her talk. It took four days for her to give me a sad, knowing smile. I just nodded. I've seen that would be all there was to say, but whenever I was going, was going on in Arlene's heart. The same day, while I was sitting in the women's room, Maxine called for me. It would be a lie to say I wasn't absolutely giddy when I ran out the door into his arms. Maxton, I breathed, falling into him. When I stepped back, he sort of fumbled a moment. I knew why. The day we left the sweet day of reception and went inside to talk, I confessed that a hard time I have having dealing with the way I felt. And I asked him not to kiss me until I was more certain. I could tell he was hurt and he nodded and hadn't broken his promise yet. I was just too hard to decipher those feelings when he acted like he was my boyfriend, but clearly wasn't. There's still, there was still 22 girls here with Camille, Michaela, and Lila, who had been sent home. Camille and Lila were simply incompatible and left with very little fanfare. Michaela got so homesick, she burst into heaving tears during breakfast two days ago. Maxon escorted her from the room, patting her shoulder the whole time. He seemed fine letting them go and was happy to focus on other prospects myself included. But he and I both knew it would be foolish of him to invest his heart completely in me whenever, even when I wasn't sure where mine was. How are you today? He asked, stepping back. Perfect, of course. What are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be working? The president of the infracture committee was sick, so the meeting was postponed. I'm free as a bird all afternoon. His eyes were gleaming. What do you want me to do? He asked, holding his arm out for me anything. There's so much of the palace I still haven't seen. There are horses here, right? And a movie theater. And you still haven't taken me there. Let's do that. I could use something relaxing. What kinds of movies do you like best? He asked as we started walking toward what I guess the stairwell to the basement was. Honestly, I don't know. I don't get to watch a lot of movies, but I like romantic ones and comedies too. Romance, you say? He raised his eyebrows like he was up to no good. I had to laugh. I t we turned the corner and continued to talk. As we approached, the mass of a guard of a palace guard pulled to the side of the hall and saluted. There had been more than a dozen men standing in the hallway. I was used to them by now. Even the sight of the collection that big couldn't distract me from the fun time I was about to have with Maxton. What did stop me was when I heard a gasp that escaped someone's mouth as we passed. Maxton and I both turned, and there was Aspen. I gasped too. A few weeks ago, I heard some administrator in the palace talked about the draft and passing. I'd wonder about Aspen and seen as I was running late to one of Sylvia's many lessons. I didn't really have a chance to speculate much. So he's been taken by the draft after all and all the places he could have gone. Maxton caught on. America, do you know this young man? I had been more than a month since I'd seen Aspen, but this was the person I spent years committing to memory the person who still visited my dreams. I would know him anywhere. He looked a little bigger, still like he'd been fed, really fed, and was working out a lot. His scraggly hair had been cut short, practically all gone. And I was used to seeing him in secondhand clothes that were barely being held together by threads. And there he was in one of the brilliant fitted uniforms of a palace guard. He was alien and familiar at once. So many of the things around him seem wrong, but those eyes, those were Aspen's eyes. My eyes fell to the name tag on his uniform, Officer Ledger. I doubted the second had passed. I kept myself composed enough so no one saw the storm raging inside, a miracle in and of itself. I wanted to touch him, kiss him, scream at him, demand he leave his sanctuary, demand to leave my sanctuary. I wanted to melt away and disappear, but I felt so very here. 
None of it made sense. I cleared my throat. throat. Yes, Officer Ledger comes from Carolina. He's actually from my hometown, I smiled at Maxon. No doubt Aspen would have heard us laughing as we rounded the corner, which I've noted that my arm was still draped on the princess. Let him make of that what he would. Maxon seemed excited for me. Well, how about that? Welcome, Officer Letcher. You must be happy to see your champion girl again. Maxon held out his hand and Aspen shook it. Aspen's face was like stone. Yes, your majesty, very much so. What did that mean? I'm sure you're pulling for her too, Maxton encouraged as he winked at me. Of course, your majesty. Aspen bowed his head a bit. What did that mean? Excellent. Since Merica is from your home province, I don't think of a better man of the palace to leave her with. I'll make sure you're put in her guard rotation. This girl of yours refuses to keep a maid in her room at night, and I've tried to tell her. Maxton shook his head at me. Aspen finally seemed to relax a bit. I'm not surprised by that, your majesty, Maxton smiled. Well, I'm sure you all have a busy day ahead of you. We'll just be off. Good day, officers. Maxton gave a quick nod and pulled me away. It took all the strength in my body not to look back. In the dark of the theater, I tried to figure out what to do. Maxton had made it clear from the night I told him about Aspen that he hated anyone who would treat me with so little care. But if I told Maxton that the man he just assigned to watch over me was the, that very person, would he punish him somehow? I wouldn't put it past him. He'd invented an entire support system for the country based on my stories of being hungry. So I couldn't tell him. I wouldn't tell him because as mad as I was, I loved Aspen. I couldn't bear him being hurt. Then should I leave? The ambivalence pulled at my heart. I could escape Aspen, get away from his face, the face that would torture me every day when I saw it and knew it was no longer mine. But if I left, I'd have to leave Maxon too. Maxon was my closest friend, maybe even more. I couldn't just go. Besides, how could I explain it without telling him Aspen was here? And my family, maybe the checks have gotten smaller. They got were smaller, but at least they were getting them. May had written saying that dad was promising our best Christmas ever this year. And I was sure that that came with the stipulation of another Christmas might never be as good. If I left, we could say how much money my past fame would bring my family. And we could save up for so much, as much as we could now. We didn't like that one, did you? Maxon asked nearly two hours later. Huh? The movie, you didn't laugh or anything. Oh, I tried to remember one piece of information, a single scene that I could say I enjoyed, but nothing registered. I think I was just a little out of it today. Sorry you wasted your afternoon. Nonsense. Maxton waved away my lackluster attitude. I just enjoyed your company, though perhaps you should take a nap before dinner. You're looking a little pale. I nodded. I was considered going into my room and never coming back out.